Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, streaming live every Tuesday from noon to 12.30 at thinktechhawaii.com. Today, we have a very exciting guest here to talk about her work and play in our beloved ocean. Writer and marine biologist Susan Scott lives in Hawaii and the Pacific Ocean aboard her 37-foot sailboat, Honu. Our oceans and the coral reefs they host are extremely valuable for the critical services they provide us. While scientific knowledge about them has both increased exponentially over the past few decades, their health has declined at a comparable rate. Since 1987, Susan Scott has been chronicling marine species and sharing her experiences with us through her weekly Ocean Watch column in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. She's also author of eight books about nature in Hawaii. A former registered nurse, Susan earned a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Hawaii and is a graduate of the university's marine option program. As a longtime volunteer for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, she's counted albatrosses on Midway Atoll, tagged coconut crabs on Palmyra Atoll, and rescued monk seals and sea turtles at French Frigate Shoals Atoll. Most recently, she's been sharing her discoveries on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. In 2014, the University of Hawaii Press published Susan's wonderful memoir, Call Me Captain, chronicling her harrowing sail through a midlife crisis and the intertropical convergence zone to reach Palmyra Atoll. Welcome, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we have here a few of your books, just a couple, and I want to point them out. The Poisonous Plants of Paradise and Exploring Hanauma Bay. Okay. And this is uh, part of a, a trilogy that I co-authored with my husband. Uh, he's an emergency doctor here in Hawaii, and so he sees a lot of these injuries. And the first is All Stings Considered, which is a marine uh, book of marine injuries and what, what to do. It's, it's written for both. These three are written for both lay people and medical professionals. And the other one is Pests of Paradise, so we've covered uh, centipedes and pigs and everything on land, and then this is poisonous plants, which uh, are not native to Hawaii, but people have brought a lot of poisonous things to Hawaii, and, and you don't really know how bad it is. Parents ask us about these, the, uh, use this book, because um, they want to know what to plant. If they have toddlers, and, and last week someone wrote me, they were getting a, a puppy, and they wanted to know you know what what they should and shouldn't yeah so you plant do cover in the garden the animals uh ones right. that are poisonous right animals. right right great yeah. terrific so and the hanama bay guide i i uh, worked with a wonderful um photographer underwater photographer david shrikti who's no longer in hawaii but we had a wonderful time with that so i'm sure that's yeah. used a lot we have that's probably one of the one it's or on two landmarks in hawaii that people never it, miss. it is and it's one of our very few unfortunately few marine protected areas and so um, this is our is second edition. So and you can see a huge difference with the reef when you're at Hanauma Bay versus anywhere else around right. the island. It's amazing to be in a place where fish are not afraid of you yeah. a and that's that's really a lot of fun and and to know that they're not naturally afraid of us ah. because when you go in a, in a protected area and swim snorkel and dive in a protected area you can tell immediately if people are fishing there or not because oh, the fish you know come up to you and are, are friendly. Terrific. Yeah. And you've told us a lot of wonderful uh, facts like this, but particularly what I've loved reading in the Ocean Watch column, which I've read for nearly the 30 years that you've been doing it, yeah. is um, about some of the most extraordinary creatures that we never think about, or that we've seen and we just have no idea right. what the story is behind them. Um, tell us some of your favorites with your Ocean Watch column. Well, one of the really fun things about writing that column is I'm always learning new things. And so if I read something, for instance, that the certain seabird, these petrels, eat sea striders, I think, what, what's a sea strider? Mm -hmm. And so when I look, um, look it up, I'm learning something completely new. And they're, they're the only marine insect in the Pacific Ocean. And they're like the water striders we see on, on ponds and I think on the mainland. I haven't seen them here. But these are surface insects, and these birds survive just by eating those. So not only do they um, find them, that, that's all the nutrients that they get. So it's, it's an amazing thing. Which kind of bird is it? That's it's the bone and petrels. How interesting. And those, I, I learned about those from going to Midway. 
And so that, so that's where I... So if those disappear, so will the brine right. and petrols. Right. Fascinating. It, everything starts in the ocean, really. It's, it's an amazing thing. So, And the other thing about the, the column is that... Um, I get to go places because I'm writing about things. And so I've had this fantastic experience to get to go to Turn Island. I went there five times when they were still sending volunteer biologists there. And that's where I got to see and fall in love with um, albatrosses, black-footed albatrosses, lace and albatrosses, uh, red-footed boobies. And so, yeah, so there's a pair of uh, black-footed albatrosses. They made for life, and they're very affectionate to each other. Hard to believe that's real, except that I've seen them quite a bit, uh, and particularly this last year at Kaena. Yeah. They were prolific at Kaena right, Point. Right, the laysans are there. And they, uh, yeah, this, this picture I took just walking by, and I just got down and shot the picture, so it, it, just a few feet from them. And they're not, they have no uh, natural land predators, so they're not afraid of us. And tell us where exactly is Turn Island? Turn Island is uh, in French Frigate Shoals Atoll, about 500 miles northwest of Hawaii and up in the Leeward Islands. And Midway, just for reference, is about 1,000 miles, maybe 1,100. So it's halfway between, between here and the end of the chain. And how did you get there? I got there different ways. I, I've, uh, they used to fly there, but they stopped doing that. And then I went by boat a couple times. But flying it was, was much better. It's a long, mm. hard trip. You know, the waters offshore and uh, Pacific, middle of Pacific here are very rough. So, yeah. Well, I'm surprised yeah. to hear, hear that. We're going to talk later about your incredible journey yeah. to Palmyra. But, um, and the column, the other thing about the column is that I, I have just been able to fall in love with things in the ocean because I, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Wisconsin, landlocked, and didn't know anything about it. But th I'm still as excited as I was when I first went to school here at UH about just how amazing it is. And I really love sharing that. And so um, when we first moved here in the early, early uh, 1980, there were very few sea turtles. And mm -hmm. so we named the, our sailboat Honu, which, which was not a common name at the time. And now, you know, there's turtles everywhere. And they are, people know the word Honu, which is pretty nice. And so it, I get to share those things with, with my readers, which is And this is a, a green sea thing. turtle? This is a green sea turtle, yeah, and this is coming ashore. This is, now they, you didn't see them a lot because they were threatened. And they were threatened, and they had only been protected for about seven or eight years at the time I was here. And so if you saw a turtle, it was a big deal. And uh, now, now we really do see them all over the place. And we take it for granted, but when you get out to the South Pacific Islands of Tahiti or Marquesas, and, and I've just been in Australia, you don't see turtles like that at you all. You don't. Not at so all. And they won't let you get anywhere near them. It, it's really reassuring then that our protection efforts and all the work that marine biologists like yourself do pays off. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the, the turtles are a, a big success story, and you can see from, you know, th however many years it's been since the Endangered Species Act, I think that was 74 or 76, that, that they've really come back. And so then that doesn't, you don't see that in other places. So, yeah, protection, protection in little areas, in, in, in certain areas, you don't have to protect everything, but you do need to protect some areas. And Particularly their breeding grounds their breeding and grounds. their main feeding areas. Right, right. Yeah. And for fish, you, you know, if you protect one area like Hanama Bay, they multiply. And so then there's more fish outside. That's, that's kind of hard to get, to get done yeah. politically. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. about that. Um, okay. Tell me a little bit uh, about the politics in Hawaii that you've experienced over the years. You've been looking at the reef all these years. I know you've seen some negative changes right. as well. Right. Um, what, what are some of those that you've not seen come back? Well, one of the, uh, one of the problems, I think, is that people have grown up here fishing and doing fishing, d different methods of fishing, in certain areas all their lives, and their parents did it, and their grandparents, and it's really hard to change that. And so if you make a place no fishing, it, it gets a lot of people very emotional, very fast. And, and so I, I don't really get involved in that as much as I, as I did when I first moved here because I think I can do more for protecting our wildlife by making, showing other people 
how wonderful it is and why, why, we, why we should love it. What, what these animals are and what they do that we have no idea. They're like aliens from another planet. They're, they're so amazing. And so that, that's my contribution. Is, and I also try to translate uh, what researchers are doing from their scientific papers to, to the lay terms. And so we can uh, understand what, what people are doing too. Because I think that's another thing that gets lost in the journals. And then mo people are doing some amazing things and no one else really knows about that. So, so that's my contribution rather than trying to get... Um, marine conservation districts made, which is extremely difficult politically. Yeah, I know one of the current issues that's uh, in everybody's mind is expanding Papa Hanaumu Kuakea right. um, National Marine Monument. Right. And it's the battle between the fishermen right. who feel that they are protecting the species yeah. by the existing monument and staying uh -huh. away, but their fisheries will be threatened. Right. Um, and so where do we find that balance right. between yeah meeting the needs of traditional fishermen as well as commercial to meet the demand for fish and we all want to have a healthier diet which includes fish that's right and protecting yeah. those so they can be uh, flourish you know right. further yeah yeah it, it's a fine line and, and one interesting thing i found over the years too is people uh in, in the con in the conservation side of things who really want to protect things don't agree either Th they don't agree that this area is, needs protection, or th this is the place we should protect rather than this, and so so it's really hard to get a consensus on. on so the those science sorts of isn't finite. No, always changing. Right. Lots of different opinions. Yes. Just like politics. Exactly. It is politics. Yeah. It yeah. is politics. It is. Yeah. Um, and in the process, might we lose some specific species? What are some that well, that there's we're concerned a, about? Right now, there's a push to protect. Um, Oh, pilot whales that that Hawaii has its own I think it's pilot whales I was just reading about this and so uh, one of the environmental groups is suing the uh, federal government fish US Fish and Wildlife Service to make to make a protective area for these pilot whales because we have a distinct I think it's oh yeah it's um, false killer whales excuse mm -hmm. me false killer that we have we have our own population and there's only 150 and if we keep don't protect them, and I'm not sure what measures they need for protection, but I know a couple of the researchers who've spent years studying them, um, you know, they'll, they'll go extinct. Right. So that's just one issue, but uh, that's good. it's a battle for 150 whales to stop people from fishing, which I think is one of the issues. Right. I don't know how, how you and judge that. We're right. gonna take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about one other species I'm aware of oh. that we all okay. love. So okay. we'll be right back with Sustainable Hawaii. Football team under Rolovich is gonna kick butt this season. In case you didn't understand me, University of Hawaii football team is gonna kick butt under Rolovich this season. So be sure to follow us on Think Tech Hawaii and Hibachi Top. I'll be at every game. And remember, aloha! Hi, my name is Kim Lau and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha! Hi, we're back with Sustainable Hawaii and we're talking with the author and columnist Susan Scott. And she most recently wrote, actually in 2014, Call Me Captain, which is a memoir I absolutely love. One of the things that you did so well was besides the fact that you, you write well and it's very humorous, Thank you. Um, is that you keep us on the edge of the seat about the, the um, sail trip to Palmyra and your research, you make it come alive and sound so intoxicating, I love it. So tell us about Call Me Captain and the trip. The funny thing about this, uh, this manuscript, it went out to a peer review because it's a university book, uh, press book, and the, it came back and one, there's two reviewers, one said, there's way too much 
personal stuff between the, the beginning and what happens to the sailboat. I would like to just get to the get to the boat. And the other reviewer said, well, I didn't like the boat the stuff so much. I, I wanted to know a lot more of the personal things. And of course, it, one was a man and one was a yeah. woman. So I thought, well, that's a good, that's a great balance. So it is a perfect the, balance. The, the men really liked the sailing parts and the women liked some, the, some of the personal things because it was, you know, it was a hard time for me. I was... Well, as of, a former sailor, yeah. I will uh, tell you, I thought it had perfect amount of both. Oh, good. Thank um, you. Because good. I was fascinated by the repairing of the ship, actually the preparation, rehab, re rehabilitating uh -huh. your boat that had been in dry dock, and then also the repairs that you had to do for your return right. trip. So if, if there are any boat lovers out there, you absolutely should read this book because it's almost like a, a fun, adventurous how-to manual it is. on how to prepare <laughs> for a major ocean trip. Because I did not know what I was getting into when I did it. So. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a, quite an adventure in all ways. So tell us about the trip to Palmyra. That I had since I volunteered for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for for the Northwest chain, um, I got an offer to volunteer at Palmyra to do a study that they were doing to, for the um, Pisonia trees, and so. I didn't have any way to get there, and I really, it was a time in my life when I really wanted to go. It was a four month, about a four month stint. And so I thought, well, I have a sailboat, so I'll, I'll just do that. And then I, I did sail there and work for four months, and it was just a fantastic experience. Palmyra is about a thousand miles south of here, so it's not easy to get to. And there's um, man co managed by Fish and Wildlife Service and also Nature Conservancy. So um, there's a. Uh, Hard, hard place to get to. And you make it sound yeah. easy, and I don't want to give the book away, but the, the trip itself was turned into quite an adventure. It was. And it, it was trepidatious, <laughs> and it's a great read. Thanks. So Thank um, you. I won't give it yeah. away. We had a catastrophic boat failure, so I'll leave yeah, it at we'll that. leave it at that. And my husband sailed all of his life. He's been sailing since he was six years old, and he said, I have never seen that happen. Yeah. So yeah. I had never heard of it either, yeah, but it's yeah. something that we all. So think. sailors, are, sailors, when they when they see what happens, are just really surprised. Yeah. But we made it, of course. Yeah. So. And then your description of Palmyra Atoll is just you bring it alive. I've never heard anyone make rats sound endearing. Oh, they are. But you you yeah. made me want to hang out with them. Well, there aren't any anymore. The, one of the great things is uh, my my first mate that I sail there with, um, a good friend, dear friend still, uh, Alex, um, finished his PhD and went back and did a rat eradication and was in charge of that and there's, it's rat free now, five years. Fabulous. And, and the importance of that was? It's changed the, uh, the ecosystem entirely because they were eating the seeds of native, uh, native plants and they were eating native crabs and so, yeah, it just changed everything. So and his he's research a, actually started with the ants that were killing the Pisonia, Pisonia trees. trees. Well, that was another person's research. That was a different okay. story. But, but Alex was there doing, looking at what, what kind of plants uh, would grow if their rats weren't eating the oh, seeds. Okay. And so he was looking at what the rats were doing. And then he got rid of all the rats, which, which is a hard thing for oh. a biologist because they're animals and you have to kill 30,000 animals. That's a pretty sobering moment, but it really has saved the atoll, I think, a lot of species on the atoll. Well, as endearing as you made them sound, it would make me more comfortable <laughs> to come to Palmyra. <laughs> well, they weren't, they weren't aggressive. Yeah. They, they were actually, li like all animals, if you aren't chasing them and trying to kill them and trying to, sp you know, spear them and trap them, they, they lose their fear. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons we, we found them endearing. So what is so special about the Pisonia trees? That that the Pisonia important? trees is a species, uh, it's a species of tree that only grows on Pacific Island atolls. And there aren't very many left because they are, um, well, people have lived on the atolls and, and, and they have introduced alien species and they've built things. You know, Palmyra was a military base during World War II. And so the ones that are left are uh, awesome. They're beautiful. And there's one in Australia, an, an island, a full Pisonia forest on an atoll in the Great Barrier Reef National Park. And I just saw that and it was just an amazing thing. And one interesting thing about the Pisonia trees is they have sticky fruit, very sticky fruit. And the little black knotties, which is a seabird that we have here and in Australia, uh, nest in it. And when the, when the chicks fall out of their nest, which 
is natural selection. It's they do. They get caught up in the sticky. They get out of the nest. They're mm -hmm. getting ready to fledge. They get caught in the sticky fruit and fall to the ground and die and fertilize the tree. Oh. So it's this amazing, kind of hard to watch uh, system of of um, natural system of the tree fertile, getting itself fertilized. Right. And so there's signs in uh, the Australia Pisonia forest that said, please don't try to rescue the baby oh, noddies because you know that's part of this is part of the yeah. natural system and that forest is is beautiful it's got a huge canopy so you're at least like you're in a tree cave so it really is providing a full ecosystem for bird life but also i imagine yeah. uh insects and, right. and other things so when they were dying they were falling down rapidly right um, right and that would i would imagine that would also upset the uh erosive protection of the islands, right? If right. The pol if the pisonia trees died? Right, because this, the soil under them is spongy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, they, they have a really huge canopy. So it's important that they remain to hold those atolls right. intact right. in every which way. And in Palmyra, they thought the trees were falling down because of the, they were just tipping over, and they thought it was because of ants farming scale, which is an alien species there. Mm -hmm. And so it uh, turned out that just by nature, they they took they healed themselves. Oh, interesting. The Pisonia trees stopped falling down. No one really did anything. You know, there were some studies of what we should do or maybe could do, and so there's a lot of theories of what was happening. Oh, does uh, any of it involve the rats? No. Oh, interesting. No, no, no. yeah. Because they started getting better before the rats were eradicated. Yeah. But you know, the water table. There's there, there's several theories of what happened to make them. And my husband, who's a physician, says, well, people and, and organisms get immunity, natural immunity from things, and maybe they just, fit, the trees finally got immunity from the scale. Oh, interesting. So it was interesting. Well, you didn't have immunity to the elements, and I know that you have a slide here of uh, working on your boat. And oh, yeah. I, I'm so impressed by the fact that you did this in your middle age, if I may right, say. Right, right, I was 56. Um, 56 and and boy yeah. if I could do that next year I'd be really proud of myself. <laughs> well it wasn't something I thought I would ever do but once I was there I didn't have any choice and I think sometimes that's the best way to do do things. People ask me how to learn to sail especially women and I say just buy a sailboat. And that's you up on the top of that's the mast? That's me at the top fixing. Fixing the, the boat yeah. and which you had already refurbished on your own. Right. To, to in Honolulu yeah. and sailed across with one mate. Right. And uh, it's, yeah. it's just so impressive. Yeah. So a, a lot of us uh, women in our middle age are going to take heart and let's see how many <laughs> of us are launching from Honolulu well, Harbor next year. <laughs> That's right. Well, it doesn't just have to be sailing. I think, you know, sometimes just getting out on, on your own and doing something that you don't think you can do is really surprises uh, all of us because I, I surprise myself. So. I'm, I'm not a natural born sailor by any means. And, and in addition to being a volunteer and working on these research projects, you also wrote your column while you were there. I wrote my column and sent it in by satellite phone. And so uh, I got to write about different things that I was f seeing at sea and also I just got back from the Great Barrier Reef yeah. sailing there and so that was an amazing experience. Well, some of the um, species that you saw at Palmyra, though, are particularly fascinated me. You wrote about oh. the coconut crab. Right. And, yeah, uh, the coconut crab. Tell us about it. Well, they're huge. You can see the scale of, of, from this one because he's carrying a coconut, and they are crazy about coconuts. They can climb trees to get them, but they don't need to because coconuts fall. And so they just, it take, they have one big claw. He's holding one, the claw there for cutting. And, and that's a full grown and, coconut, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's the inside of a whole, yeah, the coconut. And so they tear with one claw and cut with the other, tear, cut. For the green coconut, it takes them about 24 hours to get uh, a, to, down to the meat. Which is about how long it would take me to well, I know. I, I, so I'm I, amazed. I, yeah, yeah. Well, we have tools too. Right. So, yeah, they're amazing, and they're they're not aggressive at all. They are. Um, but I imagine they could take your finger off. They them. do. They they can. Yeah. So yeah. But, Phenomenal. So, I, I was a little. I was too afraid of them to pick them up because you have to pick them up from the back with one hand, and I wasn't sure I could hold them. I was strong enough to hold them. So when we were doing some tagging with them and measuring, the 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 men usually pick them up and then. 
the women did the tagging. But they're, yeah, they're big. And they almost yeah. went extinct because they're good eating? Because they're good eating, and Palmyra, I think, is one of the few. There's a couple other uh, uh, islands in the world where they're protected, but, but in other places, like in the Tahiti Society Islands, people still eat them. And uh, I've been there, and they're eating little tiny ones, which is... So they're not getting they're the not chance getting to, the, full to reproduce. Order. And they, they live up to how many years? They think they might live up to 100 years. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. But they mature slowly, and so if you eat the small ones, like any species, that before they're reproducing, they're, they're going to go extinct. So they can't reproduce until how I many don't, years? I don't know that anyone knows mm -hmm. how many years, but, yeah. but it's, it's the slow, they're slow okay. maturing. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. you, you've brought up the trip to Australia, and yeah. you just came back. Right. And tell us what you found there, because the Great Barrier Reef is something we all want to go see. Oh. But we've heard a lot about the dying yeah, of the reef. Right. Did, what was your experience? My experience, my personal experience, I was at, from the southern part of the reef to the central. I didn't go up toward Cairns, which is uh, one of the northern parts of the reef outside there. And uh, I saw no bleaching. And so I was on snorkeling and sailing around the islands the, the uh, inside the reef and a couple times you have to wait for the weather to be really good to be able to actually get out to the outer reef and the couple times I was out there it was just awesome beautiful the coral there is just hard to it's just hard to keep looking at because every time I try to take a picture of every different kind I think there's 300 some species and of this coral one is a it's a soft coral and so you just be snorkeling around and you just see these soft corals uh, you know wiggling out from the hard corals and there's a big competition there for space because there's there's so many species trying to live in this one area but the um and this one is this is an another hard coral. this is a hard coral that look like little flowers when you um you can see that the, the tips are, are flowers and there's a really beautiful close-up and that one is is budding so it's making more corals and that's how they that's how this species uh, reproduces. They they do shed eggs and sperm once a year, but they also bud like this. And so you could get really up close to them and watch them, the different kinds of corals, how, how they react with each other. And there, there's fighting, not that we can see, but between the, uh, the larvae of the species, when they get down, they sort of, you can see videos of the, the little polyps fighting each other for the space. Well, those are so. fantastic. And I think we're going to have to have you come back just to talk oh, about the Great yeah. Barrier Reef. Right. Unfortunately, we're out of time, oh. but thank you so much for coming, and I, in, I really encourage our audience to read Call Me Captain. It's a great read, and we'll be back next Tuesday with Sustainable Hawaii. Thank you for joining us.